Okay. Hey, you gotta upload that audio, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, what's up with that? So I'm gonna do this. Yeah, that's our new schedule for today. It is, man. Good morning. Welcome back to the Art of Coaching podcast. I think this is the first time that we've done like a, a live intro. Welcome to the Art of Coaching, where we ramble on about all things health and fitness. Yeah, I was told, I was giving some feedback from someone probably about a year ago, and they were like, hey, like a good idea for your podcast is at the beginning of every episode to say the episode title. And I, or the, the, not the title, but the, ooh, that was a good crack. Nice crack. But it, uh, or the episode number. Okay, uh, like, so welcome to the Art of Coaching, episode number 61. 61, man. Wow. So think about this, we've done a really good streak. You know, we're averaging one per week. Yeah. So we'll be up over 100 by the end of the year. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So okay. today's episode, Rob did give me some good feedback too. He, uh, he wants us to specifically call out the question and not just kind of roll right into it. So okay. <clears throat> I don't know if he meant to do it at the top of the podcast, but the questions, some of the listener questions that we're going to cover today are about sugar, so how much sugar should one consume? Okay. We're gonna talk about workout learnings, i.e. what are you thinking about mid-workout? Okay. And how does this inform and influence your workout in the moment, and then the subsequent workouts that you're going to do after that? We'll expand on that, and then whatever else we come up with after that. Yeah, so I actually have a question, and we'll get it out here too, um, if you wanna type it while I talk, but in the 5 p.m. class on Monday night, we were doing good mornings, and Tina actually asks, like, because the focus of our block training that we're in right now is upper body pulling progressions, and, or upper body pulling strength and scapular control, and so, or really hollow and arch ability. And so Tina asked on the day we were doing good mornings, how do hollow arches, or how do, how do good mornings help improve our hollow and arches? Oh, and so I was that's like, a really good question. And I thought she was kind of being a smart aleck, so I started laughing, I'm like, yeah, yeah right? And then she was like, no, really, like that, that was an actual question. I'm like, well, that's, that's a really good one. She's a great question asker. So I think to answer or to ask a, a general question in the same way she was asking is, how does movement A help us attack this priority that seems somewhat unrelated? And so I thought that was a really good question that I was kind of put on the spot by her. Um, and so I, I figured if she's asking, other people are wondering it. If one person asks it, then multiple people are probably wondering, so yeah. So, first of all, thank you for the feedback for the people who told us to say the name of the podcast so people know what we're doing, who we yeah, are. Who we are, what we're doing. Um, so, Art of Coaching, episode number 61. Like Josh said, we're going to be talking about sugar, inner workout thinkings, and uh, movements, and priorities, and stuff like that. But before that, we have some current events. We do have some current events. Yeah. So, first one we have is the Consistency Challenge which is coming up here, not this coming Monday. Today is the Wednesday the 13th, so not this coming Monday, but the following one, Monday the 25th, starts our consistency challenge. So still some time to sign up for that if that's something you're thinking about doing. And I mean, if you need help with anything regarding your sleeping or your eating or your movement or your management, like this is probably gonna benefit you. Um, not to make this like a sales pitch, but like I was just talking to someone in the class who was like, yeah, I signed up for the challenge because like I just need someone yelling at me more about these specific things. Like that the challenge is attacking. So mindset, nutrition, overall consistency. Yes. So she's like, I and she works really with this person works really well with Stephanie. And so I was like, that's a perfect then. Yeah. A, that's a match made in heaven right there. She actually literally said she's like, I need Stephanie like yelling at me more. I'm like, okay, awesome. We all need a little Stephanie yelling at us. <laughs> And so, yeah, so the challenge is coming up. And then, of course, the Alpine 5K trail run that you're, you started training for. I did start training for it. It's a unique training plan. It's called um, Get Santa Claus. 
that's what my dad and I call Santa, Santa not Santa Claus, Santa Claus. Um, we have funny little names for everything. Uh -huh. If you've ever been around my dad and I, there's no word that is said normally. But anyways, um, yeah, so Santa dropped off a new basketball hoop for Jesse, which, if we're being honest, was as much a gift for me and the rest of the family as it was for him. But Is it like a typical like six or like seven to ten foot yep. tall one? Nice. Yes, that's nice. awesome. Um, but anyways, if you've ever been over to our house, uh, it sits at the end of our driveway, but our driveway is elevated relative to our backyard, so anytime a ball like bounces over it, I have to jump this wall and not break an ankle, and then our backyard has kind of got some funky topography in it. I never thought that I'd work that word into a, uh, a, a podcast nice word. Uh, on the art of coaching, but yeah, so it's just really weird undulations in our yard, so you know, that's jokingly been my trail run training plan is go out shoot hoops miss a bunch of shots and chase the ball over the wall and try not to break your neck do you have to miss the shots on purpose to train for the run or does that just happen naturally no no no. i'm trying to make them on purpose <laughs> but i just miss them more than i make them that's probably that's probably why i'm not in the nba right now yeah that's that's how mine goes sometimes i'm lucky if i hit uh the net Yes. Like at all, or yeah. the rim, or the backboard. Yes, like, so you're a good air baller. Yeah, if I hit yeah. anything, any part of the hoop, I, it's a pretty good thing. I'm just impressed that you knew those parts of the, the basketball apparatus. Not, <laughs> not as dumb as I look. Oh, we do need to cover sponsors, because uh, oh, I know yes. we have uh, two new sponsors. The first one is not Kill Cliff, um, although that crack of the can was very good. Uh, cold coffee, another good sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, this thing that came in the mail, I don't know if you took the liberty of flipping through this, but this is the Two Brain Business State of the Industry um, analysis. This is just kind of like a short little, uh, uh, little pamphlet about some highlights of the fitness industry and what happened in the year 2020. So the, the full booklet is actually like an 84 page, basically a full color magazine that goes over the state of the fitness industry. So. Uh, thanks for uh, to Two Brain Business for not sponsoring this episode. Yeah. And then we have a really special one, uh, courtesy of Adrian. Uh, we had some some new. Oh yes. yes. Look at this. I, I, you guys can see this on the live video if you're listening. But Adrian, God bless her. She brought in all of these expo markers because for some reason ours dry out. Yeah. And like even after we start yelling at people to keep the caps on. Like, I say yelling, it's not really yelling, guys. Relax, okay? It's 2021. Stop being so offended. But yeah, it's it, probably going make some derogatory side remark, you know? Rude yeah, rude. like, hey, put the cap on the markers. They still dry out. So Adrian brought in, there was like 18 yes. multicolored markers. So if you guys can see this. So it's all like, kinds of colors. Look yeah. at that. Purple, green, orange, red, blue, indigo, violet. Brown. All the colors of the rainbow. And doo-doo brown. What's the difference between indigo and purple? Is it just... Or I blue? Know. I don't know. Just call it purple. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, so Expo, all the ones Josh named, the house. Shout out to the house family. Uh, it turns out they don't live in Colorado anymore. They, <laughs> Imagine that. Because they're part of our Because they are local. Yeah, right? So. Uh, Speaking of, okay, so let's cover this real quick. If okay. you have moved in like the last two years, you know. Yeah. Can you do us a solid? I think that's what they call it. Do yeah. a solid. Go into your account. If you open up the Wattify app and hit settings in the upper right hand corner, you can go into your account info and update your address information. So we don't look like a bunch of doofuses sending it to the wrong address. Yeah, so on January 7th, when we get a return Christmas card <laughs> yeah. from Colorado. Yeah. I'm just gonna open it. Actually, I'll drop it off. Yeah, house. drop off their house. Don't you know where they live? Yeah, on, Mark. just go to live all these. They actually actually give it to Bart. They live in Bart's neighborhood. Yes. So. Oh, okay. No, no, no. no. Yeah, that will make it there. Um. So we do. I was wanted to tell the story on the uh, on the actual recording. I have a hard out at eleven thirty today. Okay. So apparently that's like when you get big. And you have all these people running your schedule for you, and you have all these obligations and everything. Yeah, that's that's the term that you use. I've got a, I've got a hard out by this. That means I can leave no later for my next obligation or my next appointment than eleven thirty today. So actually, you know, I'm not important like that at all. But you have people running your schedule for you? Uh, it's uh, Google. It's this uh, Mr. <laughs> Google. Yeah. Um, I was watching this uh, YouTube video about. 
uh, the tailor-made golf team of which Tiger Woods is a part of it. And then, so they had all these guys that are famous PGA Tour players. They were trying out some new clubs, and Tiger was one of them. And this his handler, I think, is what these people are called, assistant really. But like his handler came over and said, "Hey, you know, you got a hard out in 20 minutes." And then five minutes later, he popped in, "Hey, you got a hard out in 15 minutes." So you know, um, uh, I'm just preparing for that level of uh, you know yeah, one responsibility day. one day. Jeez. How old is he now? I don't know, mid 40s? Mid 47, I want to say. Not to derail this too much, but did you see the videos of him golfing with his son? It's amazing. I actually watched a lot of that tournament. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah, it's, and they were, they were like matching. And was, yeah. His it's son cool. hit that ball probably 10 times as far as I can. Could you throw it one tenth of the distance that he hit it? One tenth? How far was he in? <laughs> he was in there like 200 yards, wasn't he? Yeah, so did you throw up 20 yards? <laughs> no. That's going to be close. <laughs> so anyway, your story, why do you have a hard out? Oh, I've got an, another podcast to uh, prep for. But you have a story it, about... That's where that term came from. Oh, that was story. <laughs> I know, it was good. Yeah. Man, you want me to tell the story again? No, that's good, man. Yeah. Um, Great story. Tell it again, why don't you? It's got to be some very humbling... Now, like... Tiger's been a big deal for a long time now. Yeah. And so, you know, when, when he was, when did he win his first major? When did he, like, 19 or 21 or something? He was 97, so, yeah, he's probably, yeah, right right around there. I mean, he just turned pro. Like, at that young of an age, or think, like, child actors, like, basically growing up and living the majority of your life that way. Yeah. Where, like, your schedule's managed for you by somebody else. It's like... And I think, not, we don't have to get into this, but a lot of people are like, you know, that's why Michael Jackson turned out so, like, strange or odd mm -hmm. in his older age because he didn't really have a childhood. It's like, yeah. you know, when, you, when you're under, no matter what age you start at, when you're under that sort of, I guess, stress or a microscope, a microscope for right. so long, like, what does that do to a person? So it's funny that you bring that up. Uh, <clears throat> I was listening to Jordan Peterson's podcast, who I'm a big fan of. His books is, uh, or, or one of his books is on my list, my next to read list, 12 Rules for Life. But he had Matthew McConaughey on, so Matthew McConaughey just wrote a book. So he, Matthew McConaughey has kept journals throughout his life since he was 14 years old, and he's like 50 now. Wow. So he went off famously like into the desert three or four different times with nothing but his journals, and like I think he the story that it tells is like with like 15 gallons of water, a couple of pounds of red meat, and just, you know, sifted through it. Basically, it came out with this book, Green Lights, that he just released. So he's making the, the rounds, all the interviews. And so he was on Jordan Peterson's podcast. And that's one of the things that he, uh, Jordan Peterson asked him was, you know, do you remember becoming famous? Like, was there a, was there a moment or did it just gradually happen? He goes, no, I remember it very distinctly. And he tells the story of, being on one of the famous boulevards in California on like a Friday afternoon and walking around. And this is when he had actually been in a couple of movies. He was in Dazed and Confused, but this is right before his first breakout leading role in A Time to Kill came out in 96. He said I was walking around this boulevard on a Friday afternoon and, you know, say there's 400 people there, maybe four people, you know, recognize me or maybe they, they look at me because they think I'm a cute young guy or I've got nice clothes or whatever. But nobody else knew who I was. Fast forward, that movie launches that weekend. I'm back on the same area on Monday afternoon, and 396 of those people all knew who I was and wanted something from me. He's like, so just literally overnight had this superstar level of fame. And so they, they talk about, you know, the difficulties, the trappings, um, you know, the pros, the cons, all those kinds of things. But I haven't made it all the way through the interview because it's almost three hours long, but it's a really, really good conversation. Two things. One, I didn't know Jordan Peterson had a podcast. I gotta listen to that. It's phenomenal. His daughter does too, and I've listened to some of hers. She's a fantastic interviewer. Really? Yes. I. They each have their own podcast. Mm -hmm. I'll have to check both of them out. Um, so, Emily and I, on the way to and from St. Augustine, we listened to Joe Rogan's interview with Matthew McConaughey. And it sounds very similar to Jordan Peterson's. And because, you know, she was like, I had never listened to Joe Rogan's podcast. And I don't really listen to it. 
um, too much, but we were like scrolling through looking for someone we both knew. And I was like, what about McConaughey? And she's like, yeah, let's listen to it. And he told the same story, you know, I guess using the same numbers, which is probably something he wrote in his book, is 396 to 4, and the same thing after A Time to Kill came out. And, and you would think that, like, oh, that's just, you know, some handsome guy that's been in movies with that, you know, his, his Texas draw or whatever. Yeah. But, dude, like, after listening to that, like, I knew he was kind of spiritual yeah. in, in a sense. After listening to that show, I have such a huge respect for yeah. McConaughey because he is so unbelievably spiritually sound yeah. and wise and intelligent and he conveys ideas really well. Yeah. Better than you would and you would think. Like better than maybe the impression he gives off. And maybe that's my bad for interpreting him yeah. that way. But that it, he's so unbelievably smart and wise and it was really cool to listen to him tell those yeah. those stories and yeah, so his book will be next on my list too. No, You'll read McConaughey's. Yep. And you said Jordan Peterson has a book. He's yeah, he's well, he's written several, but the one that I really am in, most interested in first is his Twelve Rules for Life. Okay. Yeah. He's awesome. Yeah. A lot of people don't like him on both sides of the political compass. Yeah. But that's why he's awesome. I <laughs> love him because he is so far on the logic side that it like tickles that part of my brain because yeah. I am probably far more left-leaning, not from a political standpoint, um, but just from a like left-brain, right-brain perspective. Right. Yeah. So it, it, he just he's, he's very well-spoken. He extends arguments out. He respects nuance and context, which if you've listened to any of our episodes, you know <laughs> that's very in, in our wheelhouse. So it makes sense um, they would be interested in that. Yeah. So, you mentioned something. I, we hadn't had a chance to talk about it, uh, yeah. but you just got back from your trip. Yeah. So, St. Augustine. So, is there some highlights? Uh, you know, it was a good trip? Yeah, I'm going to, because you asked it, I feel like you asked it in that way. People are anticipating some sort of big announcement. And <laughs> Emily and I are not engaged. And She's no, listening right now. Oh, She's she really? and commenting. And, uh, let's see. Does she really? She talked about the Joe Rogan podcast. She's near what you said. Oh, okay. I didn't even have that open. Um, no, Emily and I are not engaged. And if Jim Godin tells you we are, then we aren't. Because, like, Monday morning, Jim, we were in here and Jim, like, announced to the gym. He was like, hey, everybody here, Mark's engaged. <laughs> <laughs> or it was, like, Monday or Tuesday. Gosh. And I was, like, oh, I, I was just laughing. But, no, so we went to St. Augustine. Josh, I know you're really familiar with the city. Yep. I think a lot of people, if you're local, like, you've been to that city once or yep. twice. Real cool place. Yeah. Like, what I really liked about it, what Emily and I kind of kept saying over and over, a couple of things, is the first is, like, we stayed in the Airbnb outside of the historic district, but it was, excuse me, it was, like, an eight or nine minute drive there. Mm. And it didn't even feel like that. Like, it felt maybe, like, three or four minutes, and yeah. you're there, and you park, and everything is so close. But overall, everything in that whole area is so nearby that... That on top of the second thing we constantly discussed was like everything you did took no more than maybe an hour. Mm -hmm. So like each of the sightseeing things you would do. So on top of like going and doing the fun touristy things or like the historic things and learning, and then at like at all the restaurants you went to on top of that, you're probably doing between like five and seven things in one day. Yeah. And it's it doesn't feel like it. It, it's, it was just really cool. It was nice to, of course, like get some quality time just us together. Yeah. Um, it, it was a really good time. It's easy to pack a lot in uh, in one day just because everything is right there. And it reminded me, actually, so we got, Mandy and I, for those who don't know, we actually got married in St. Augustine. And then we, believe it or not, we went to Las Vegas for our honeymoon. Ooh. And Vegas is uh, similar in, in this, probably just this only way, not in any other way, but that you can pack a ton in in one day because you're you're just walking everywhere and everything is just right you that you could possibly want to do is right there uh -huh. so um but yeah we we absolutely love it so we got married there mandy's been back a couple of times for girl trips um but her and i have only recently been back at our 10-year anniversary a few years ago so i've only been there the day well obviously we went there before the um wedding we were there for getting married and then for our 10 year. 
it's cool because I don't know if you feel the same way, but like on our last night, Emily was like, would you go back? And I was like, yeah, I'd go back. And she's like, what, what would you want to do? And we, we did a lot of the big touristy mm-hmm. things. So like we saw the big four, um, uh, Castillo de San Marcos. I meant to ask you if you did go to that. Yep. So we went to that. We did the Fountain of Youth. We did the old jail. So like we, we did the lighthouse. We did all the big things. Like, if I were to go back, it would probably just be to, like, check out all the nooks and crannies, yeah. little places, like the, di- so the dive many. bars or yeah. the cool dessert places or something that we didn't get to check out. Because we saw a couple, but I feel like there are so many that you didn't see. Right. And so it'd probably just be, like, a like an overnight sort of thing. Like, you go and you just check out a bunch of different places, you know, over the course of a day or two. Um, but it was cool. It was really cool. Um, all right, so before we get to the listener questions, we had a really cool year in review from yeah. one of the podcast hosts, uh, hosting platforms that we published to. Is it Buzzsprout? Buzzsprout. They did something called the year in review where we get some kind of interesting statistics, and I don't have it up on my screen, I know you said you do, yeah. so um, why don't you share some of those, some of these things, some of these highlights. Yeah, so we post on Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud, and Buzzsprout sent this cool year in review, and we've only, the cool part about this is we've only been doing this, or using this platform since August. So really, all of these, because we've had podcast episodes at the beginning of the year too, and yes. the beginning of 2020, Yeah. so all of this, you can just inflate it, I don't know, 10% or something like that, but... Our 2020 year in review, uh, these three big big statistics, we had 21 episodes published, and that was just in the last third of the year. Wow. So really, we're on pace for 63 episodes this year. Yeah. If we did that, but we do one a week, so that's 52. That's almost doubling what we have now. So that that alone is pretty cool to know. one thousand four hundred and forty eight minutes of content. I did not divide that by hours. Wow. But I think it was almost like twenty four hours. So like imagine we just sit here and talk for twenty four hours. Like that's that's good. Yeah. Um twenty one total downloads, which is cool. People downloaded um the episodes to listen to. That's think, pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. that is neat. That they're <laughs> actually they're not listening to it like live stream. What they're actually doing is putting it on their device and listening to it as they go. Yeah. And, and I don't think that includes like just going to the app and listening to it. Correct. So that's yeah. that's really neat. So if you did that, thank you. Um, and then it has some shareable fun facts, and we'll just rifle through these really quickly. Um, Art of Coaching published 21 episodes in 2020. The first was CFG uh, episode number 41, CFG check-in uh, with Josh Martin. That was, and the last episode was of course our New Year's special. Yep. In 2020, the most popular episode of The Art of Coaching was episode 41, so that check-in. We that very first one, yeah. That very first one back. Um, and it was downloaded 10 times. Whoa. Woo. People care about you, Josh. They want to hear you. The people want to know. In 2020, The Art of Coaching was downloaded eight times from Bloomingdale, Florida, our most popular city. Whoa, no way. What's cooler than that to me was... That's so cool. That... It was downloaded 13 times everywhere else. Whoa. Right? So think about it that way. Yeah. 13 other locations. Because I'm guessing this is generalizing this whole area. As yeah, well. I, would, I would assume so too. Because there have been times where, I, even on SoundCloud, it showed like, hey, you had 100 listens in Valrico, Florida. And I'm like, I don't think we have 100 people listening or someone listening 100 times in Valrico. So I think right. Valrico. So right. Right. Groups of area, so I think that's what's cooler is that 13 times it's downloaded somewhere else. Right. Um, in 2020, fans of the art of coaching listen most using the web browser, our Buzzsprout site, and our Buzzsprout player apps. Um, okay. So, I mean, I don't know why that's shocking because it's this is a Buzzsprout statistic. So, but I know a lot of people listen on Apple Podcasts or on SoundCloud, depending on what they have. In 2020, The Art of Coaching published 21 episodes totaling 24 hours of content. That's about 1448 minutes or 86,912 seconds for your listening pleasure. Whoa, that's a lot of seconds. It's a lot of seconds. Get those seconds. And this is the last one. In 2020, the shortest episode. This is gonna be really- <laughs> the shortest episode of The Art of Coaching 
was actually the interview we did with Mark James about our um, memorial workout. Memorial workout. Um, 13 minutes and 46 seconds. Real quick interview. That's Actually, remarkable that uh, that interview was only 13 minutes. I can't believe it, man. The longest was the one we did with... Um, Actually, I thought this was the one. It's titled Coffee Resolutions Injury Advice Stress Lesson in Earning Intensity. So that's the one we, we just covered a plethora of Oh, yeah. Times. Holy moly. When I read coffee, I thought it was the one we had coffee out there. Right. But we were actually no, in here. No, we were in here. That was a couple weeks ago. This one was one hour and 26 minutes and 14 seconds. Yeah. Well, we're not going to beat that today, but no. maybe we'll get close. But yeah, that's pretty cool. Sweet. So All right. That's our quick year in review and now I guess we can head on to uh, listener questions. questions question number one question number one how much sugar should I consume you want to go first or me I'll let you go first so I'll go first and I think it's smart because we have a lot to say on this video I'm going to pull up where the uh, slack posts we were going back and forth quite a bit on, yes. our, on our Slack post. So we have a nutrition tip every week this month. Mm -hmm. This one covers sugar. And we had a question from an athlete yesterday saying, how much sugar should I consume? And that's where it kind of comes from. And then we had a really good discussion going on in our Slack page about it. And so we consulted Stephanie. And, you know, she was weighing in, you know, as our head nutrition coach, um, weighing in on sugar and what she thinks and what she believes and what she knows. What I would say to people is having the knowledge I have now and after learning what Stephanie told us yesterday is the recommended for men is, is it 36? 37. 37 grams a day. 37 grams of sugar. So just keep that number in your head. For women is 25 grams, considerably less. Doesn't sound like it's that much sugar. I take that back. It sounds like it's a lot of sugar at first. Like, man, 37 grams of sugar, that's so much sugar. You know, that's the equivalent of nine teaspoons or six teaspoons for women. Um, but when you think about the amount of added sugar in something like a granola bar, like what I was eating when Stephanie was sending us this information. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, there's 11 grams, right? Wow. So there's there's a third, we'll just right. call it a third of my allotted sugar intake. But notice I also said added sugars. And so this is something I actually learned yesterday, is those guidelines are for the added sugars that you're having. Because natural sugars, sugars found in fruit um, and other sort of, foods like uh, that you'll naturally eat like vegetables have like some could have natural sugars in them to make them sweeter yeah. those are actually good for you um, they'll have healthy carbohydrates that are that are good for you um, and so what I'll do is I'll just yes I was, yes. was going to say I'll, I'll, I'll let you go if you have anything to no, say no, before reading what Stephanie said um, and so you asked how much sugar is it okay for me to consume daily and she said the thing to look at is added sugar. Uh, this is something that she learned this year um, because she thought that she really needed to be aware of total sugar, which is, I think, somewhere a lot of people fit into. And so they'll avoid healthy things like fruits or vegetables mm -hmm. that might have sh uh, high sugar um, uh, content. Jeez, sorry, I can't find my words. Um, so getting sugar from things like fruits and other healthy carbohydrates is very good for you, this is what Stephanie's saying. When we look at processed foods, there tends to be a lot of added sugar, and that's what we, what we need to be looking at consistently. So for men, they should consume no more than 37 grams or 9 teaspoons, and women, 25 grams and 6 teaspoons. Natural sugars in fruits and other whole foods can provide antioxidants and fiber, um, so completely avoiding sugar isn't what we're looking for. Limiting added sugars like sweeteners to coffee or other things in processed foods like glucose or corn sweetener, uh, corn syrup, dextrose, fructose, etc., is what recommendation, the recommendations previously, previously mentioned are for. Um, a personal example from Stephanie, her goal or ceiling for sugar daily is actually 77 grams of sugar, um, but this includes added sugars. 
So she wants to have about or under 25 grams of added sugars, and the rest she's going to get naturally through like fruits and vegetables. Right. And then she was just linking some things like whole milk, um, agave, things like that. But how much sugar should I consume? Under those guidelines, because I would still even say those guidelines for added sugars are high. Yeah, I I think that sometimes people overdo it on this because there is just so much information at everybody's fingertips these days, you know, and they they start concerning themselves with, well, you know, uh, an apple or a banana or a um, you, you know, grapes or grapefruit or plums, you, you know, which, you know, I don't, I don't want to have too much fruit or, you know, I, I can't have these vegetables or, or anything like that. And it's like, y you are worried about the things that are the, the tip of the very, very tip of the spear, the last thing that you should ever be worried about. Like when you get into those kinds of nuances, that should be because your performance it is how you put food on the table for your family. And we've talked about this, you know, this idea before. Yeah. 99.99999% of people don't need to ever worry about overdoing fruits and vegetables because you're not going to. It's the difference between being able to eat three apples or like an entire jar of applesauce. <laughs> the latter, super easy to do. And I bring this example up because we have a, a big jar of applesauce at home and I was getting some for the kids the other day and I made the remark to Mandy, I could sit and eat this entire jar of applesauce right now without an issue. But it probably took like 39 apples to make this thing. Wow. I could not eat more than two apples at a sitting. And, and there's a whole lot of you know, physiological process that goes into the digestion and fiber and the, the chewing and all that kind of stuff plays a role into it. So when people start to split hairs on, should I eat fruit? Should I not eat fruit? Should I eat this type of fruit or this type of fruit? You're, you're wasting your time thinking about those things. Yeah. The area that you should spend the vast majority of your time is just looking at the foods that you're eating and seeing if it has added sugars. And I'll give you a, a quick tip. If it didn't come out of the ground, if it didn't swim, if it didn't grow off a tree, if it didn't walk, if it didn't fly, and you're eating it, you have to open up a package, and when you eat it, it doesn't taste like complete garbage, it's got some sort of added sugar to it. Oh. And that, that's not you know, an indictment on anybody's food choices because mine certainly aren't perfect. I'm, nobody listening to this has what we would call like the creme de la creme optimal for food profile. But what you do need to understand is you, the things that are actually going to move the needle the most, like not to overdo a pun here, but what is the low hanging fruit? It's not you deciding between apple or orange. It's probably the six gallons of creamer that you put into your coffee over the course of a month. Right. Right? So looking at it like that. So how much sugar should you consume? Probably less than you think in terms of added sugars. Don't worry about fruits and vegetables because then you're you are removing all the micronutrients, not macronutrients, the micronutrient benefits that fruits and vegetables have in them. So stop worrying about that stuff and start looking at all the other areas where you are getting added sugar, if that is a concern of yours. And I, I think that is a, a good kind of um, number to sit on because so often we say like, it depends, talk to a coach. And yes, I think that you definitely should do that to individualize things. But if you're just looking for a general, you know, idea of it, if you're a dude, nine teaspoons of added sugar, that'll actually add up really quick. Like, what did uh, somebody said in class the other day? Like, a, how, if you have a, a Coke, you just overdid your daily sugar. Yeah. Right. Because I think a Coke does have either 36 or 38 in it. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere around 40. I know it's somewhere around there. So that's crazy. crazy. Yeah. Right. Um, and then for, for women, six, six teaspoons of, you know, added sugar. And it's, it, <clears throat> don't 
take this as, well, I'm not going in and, and eating all of these sugar, like nine te teaspoons of this uh, white sugar and consuming it. No, no, no. But think about like as the baking ingredient to make your food palatable. That's why Steph did such a good job educating us in that channel yesterday about, you know, hey, take a look at what agave has, take a look at what your milk has, but, you know, take a look at your container and just start becoming aware of, you know, what is in the foods that you are eating. And again, if it flew, if it walked, if it swam, if it grew on a tree or came up out of the ground, you don't have to worry about it. Right. Anything else, if it's palatable, good to taste, it's got added sugar, almost universally. Not, I'm not saying exclusively, but I will share this final anecdote, and I'm sure that I'm gonna irritate somebody, you know, or offend somebody, which is just fine, but the, the very first uh, CrossFit gym that I ever went to years and years and years ago, um, there was a, a member and I were talking after class one day, and we were having a very similar conversation, like, well, I'm thinking about paleo, but I don't know. You know, I, I heard that if you eat too much fruits and vegetables or, you know, this, and should I do supplement with that or avoid this? And I was like, look, nobody ever got fat from eating too much fruits and vegetables. Now, the way that I think I could have said it a little better is probably nobody ever increase their likelihood for metabolic dysfunction eating fruits and vegetables. That's now, I'm sure that there are plenty of outliers that are just slamming home fruits and vegetables and can have some issues with it. But I'm not talking about, you know, the outlier. And if you're listening, thinking that's you, no, it's not. And if you still think it is, email me directly, josh at coachingforglory.com. I would love to, honestly, I would love to have that conversation but I still stand by it. You're not going to overdo the fruits and vegetables. Like you, you, you just can't unless it's a rare, you know, one in 7 billion person who looks yeah. at a, a piece of fruit or a certain vegetable and I don't know, has a heart attack. Yeah. You have the brand new genetic mutation. Right. Yeah. Right. So going a little bit backwards to the daily recommended numbers, I just, something that occurred to me, I thought would be cool to this, Knowing numbers and like helping visualize those numbers helps me understand concepts more. So if we take the 37 grams of recommended added sugar that men should have each day, say every day you got somebody that's just real consistent, every single day they are getting those 37 grams. And we'll do that across a month. Okay, now give that for a year, that's about 30 pounds of added sugar. <laughs> oh so, my gosh. so go to the store and they have you know, yeah, they bags like this. Bags. Go buy a 30 pound bag yeah. and be like, all right, your goal, here's your New Year's resolution for 2022. Stick a spoon in there every day, and throughout the year, you have to eat that entire bag of sugar. Real quick, we're not actually recommending yeah, this. Yeah, this is yeah. just a thought experiment. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> um, but, you know, just imagine doing that. And so we'll, we'll do the same for women because their number was 25, right? So we'll just average, actually, we'll just do 25 by 365. That gives us how many grams? There are 28 grams in an ounce. That gives us ounces. There's 16 ounces in a pound. So 20. 20 uh, pounds. 20 pounds for sure. women. So 30 pounds for men, 20 pounds for women every single year. Just think about going and buying a bag and don't, you know, like Josh said, please don't actually do it. But it's interesting what you tell me because again, taking things by time and by month and by year, it's you said something really profound a couple minutes ago that you said, it, you know, it's not the, it's not the apples and the bananas and the pineapples that you eat on a monthly basis. And you said it's the six gallons of creamer you put in across a month. Yes. You know, so people think, okay, you know, I only put a, a half a, you know, a half a cup of creamer in every day. It's like, yeah, but you have three cups of coffee every day. Right. You know, that's one and a half cups, you know, and then multiple, you know, that's, that's a lot of creamer that you're doing every single day and that stuff really adds up, especially if you're like me, like the hazelnut stuff, but thank goodness I don't drink coffee, right? You know, yes. so it's like, if you like those flavored things or the French vanilla things that, you know, that that's really gonna add up and it's not right to concern yourself with the fruit yet, you know, 
until you're a professional athlete. <laughs> and then we just start talking about it. Which, to my knowledge, we don't have any of those listening. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, maybe if you are. Again, email me, josh at coachingforward.com. <laughs> 2021 is going to be a big year. Yeah. Um, but it's... Last note I kind of have is in school, you know, we take a nutrition class when you get your exercise science degree and mm -hmm. take a couple of them actually. And um, something you talk about is the glycemic index. Yeah. And so Gosh, I, I was going to mention that when I started talking about the fruits because we learned, the, I remember learning about that and it's like, well, should I have a, a low glycemic index food or a high? So, sorry, go ahead. And so that is really, again, taking nuance to a new degree and boiling it down is, you know, your, the glycemic index, for those that don't know, is basically every food that has sugar or glycogen in it, which is carbohydrates, sure, yeah. um, any food that has that component in it, which is a lot of them, falls somewhere on this index, and some rank higher than the others. So, like, for example, and we're not saying not to eat bananas, but a banana higher on the glycemic index than something like, a, I don't know, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but like rice, right? Because it's sweeter, it's going to have more of that sweet and sugar, whereas rice is more just the carbohydrate, right? Yep. And so people would think, oh, I have to, I have to, I can still eat all my rice, but I should stay away from bananas. But that's really breaking down that glycemic index and using that nuance to kind of form an, a narrative around it. And people use that, again, on social media or on pages where they say, I can't eat bananas now. Now I can't go and have bananas because it's too high in sugar. And I'm guilty of it too. There have been times where like, I don't want to have two bananas a day. I'll stick to one banana a day because I know it's high in sugar. When really, I could probably benefit from having an extra serving of fruit in the, in the banana. Yes. You know? And I really just say that because I'm reminded of it by this whole conversation. My mind's always going to that glycemic index and my impressionable brain when I read that stuff. Yeah, um, and, and absorb it because if I'm doing it, I bet other people are too. Yeah, so there's there's two things I, I I want to touch on. One is in relation to the the glycemic index, but remind me, and I'm gonna come back and re remind me of Rob Wolf. So what people have to, because I'm sure we have listeners that are like, well, I, I read this article, or I read this study, or I read this journal, or I read this paper, and such and such, you know, said, you know, that low GI foods or high GI foods. But what you have to, to keep in mind are a, a couple of things. Number one is how was the study designed? Who was being studied? What is their biological age? What is their training age? And then the, the component that most people forget is that the time component has to be attached to it. So when they do a six-week study, like that's probably the longest that we see for, you know, the effects of exercise protocols or nutrition protocols, things like that. Like, I'm not talking about epidemiological or you know, observational or self-reported studies which have a really, really low efficacy, you know, uh, rating, things like that. But there's a time component. So when you see something, oh, well, so-and-so did keto for six weeks and lost that. Yeah, but check in at the six-year mark or the 16-year mark and see where those people are. The reason why usually you don't see studies like this is because they're not very sexy to do. And it's very expensive to actually do them and do them well. Right. But I've been in the game long enough and know enough people who have also been in the game long enough to be able to speak intelligently about these things. The other thing to keep in mind is a, a lot of these studies that are that influence the the exercise, a lot of the exercise and nutrition prescriptions that you know, we've seen for, you know, 20, 30 years now come out of the performance realm. So the GI, you know, index is, the, is a very similar thing. If I'm an elite athlete, it pays for me to know what fruit, you know, is most optimal pre-game, post-game, you know, intra-workout, all those types of things. Yeah. So when you understand who is being studied, why, and for how long, then you can look at it with a little bit more of a microscopic eye and 
be intelligent about what it is that you're extrapolating from this information that you are reading. Now, to take it back to what you said in terms of you know the banana versus the rice, uh, Rob Wolf, uh, who has written, he's kind of the guy that brought paleo to the mainstream. I don't know, maybe it was 15 years ago when he first wrote his wrote one of his. I think it was his first book, The Paleo Solution, which is a really groundbreaking book. Uh, I think it's a phenomenal read for anybody, but. He wrote another one uh, a couple of years ago. I know Justin Scott and I have talked about this uh, several times, but it's called Wired to Eat. And in that book, one of the things that he has you do if you're open to it is what he calls the seven-day carb test. Um, and you actually get an understanding of how certain carbohydrates or how, how, a, how a big variety of carbohydrates can affect you know, people vastly different. Um, or with vast differences, or whatever the right way to say that is. But meaning you're going to eat some white rice and test what your glucose response, your blood glucose response is to it. It comes with a little kit or do you have to buy it? No, you buy it, but it's cheap. You can get them on Amazon, get them at the you know convenience store like Walgreens or CVS or something. But anyways, and, it's, it, and basically what he's talking about is the individual differences that people have. So... I could have, you know, six apples, you know, and it not affect me anywhere near to what it does to you. Uh -huh. But it might be that when I actually have white rice, which a lot of people would say is, oh, well, that's a low glycemic food. You can go ahead and have that. It's not going to spike my blood sugar, but it certainly can for people. And so this is where the concept of individuality really gets into the weeds, you know, good. And it's not enough to just say 3725. Right. Right. So if, if you want to go down that road, I think it's a great book to pick up. You can, you know, start to become aware of individual differences with you. Um, if maybe you don't want to dig that far, but you want to get things individualized again, you know, just talk, talk to a coach and it's not going to be, oh, well, have this fruit, not that fruit, have this vegetable and do it at this time. And no, 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 no. Like, Let's look at, again, to, to really beat this dead horse, like, what's the low-hanging fruit that's going to actually make an impact? Yeah. And it's not, you know, oh, we're going to con concern ourselves with the fruits and vegetables. I think that's all I had to say about that. I was, anytime I finish something, I think about that Forrest Gump line, and that's all I have to say about that. He goes on this, like, you know, huge diatribe the whole movie, and yeah. it's like, cuts to him. And that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, like you did is just talk about sugar for, what was that, like 22 minutes, right? <laughs> Ooh, but excuse me. That's, uh, so I guess to answer the question, how much sugar should I consume if you weren't listening in the last 22 minutes, it's a much deeper answer than just a certain amount. I guess one question, I know you got to be out of here at 11.30, but this was a question that also came up in class, in the class discussion yesterday is we mentioned Coke, right? So yep. a can of Coca-Cola, if you're a man, it's going to put you at your daily limit yep. of your added sugar. If you're oh, I know we're going with this. It's oh, going to yeah. put you 1.5 times your daily limit if you have a can of Coca-Cola. What about Diet Coke? What about Diet Pop? Soda, sorry. <laughs> I love the pop reference because that takes me back to my Midwestern roots. So I know what you're talking about whenever right. you say pop. Yeah, so Diet Pop. Diet pop. For those who don't know what that is, uh, that means Coke. Yeah, Coke is your soda. Or soda. Soda if you're... Where is soda? I think soda is everywhere that isn't the South or the North. Okay. Or the Midwest, apparently, you guys said pop. Okay. So soda is... Wait, but you say pop, too. I say pop. You do? Yeah. I know. Like, you said you guys. I'm like, you're part of these you guys. What I say you guys? You said you guys in the Midwest. Uh -huh. you you're well, part of that. I'm me guys in the in the north. <laughs> in the north. So where does diet pop fit into this? So usually the argument that's made is, oh well, look at this thing. It's it's got zeros all the way down the nutrition facts label. It doesn't have added sugars. It doesn't cost me any calories. And you have to respect the nuance of. Nutrition is more than the thermodynamic laws where it's like, you know, energy consumed and energy burned. Like that's such an elementary way of thinking of it. Like, wow, I took in zero calories, so 
I don't have anything to worry about. But what you have to remember is that everything that you consume is just information for your body when it gets in there. Well, it's not like food stuffs. It's, you know, a great example is code in a computer is just series of what? Zeros and ones. Right. Same thing whenever you put something into your body. So the body doesn't see like, oh, this is zero calories, so we can just do away with it. You know, it's gone. Uh -huh. It doesn't exist. So the science around it, and I pulled up this, um, this thing from Healthline. So because diet soda is usually calorie free, it's not always, but it's usually, I would say, um, you know, more often than not, it would be natural to assume it could aid weight loss. However, research suggests the association is not so straightforward. Um, plenty of studies have found that using artificial sweeteners, which is what gives that stuff its palatable taste, um, and drinking high amounts of diet soda. Again, what's the definition of high amounts? Anything above zero. Okay, so let's just leave that part out. Drinking diet soda is associated with an increased risk of obesity and metabolic syndrome. Obesity is something that you can see visually. Metabolic syndrome is not. So a lot of times people will say, oh, well, you know, I'm looking at our in-body poster over here, and it's like, oh, well, I'm thin, you know, I'm not clinically obese or anything like that. You know, diet soda's fine. But internally, what is actually happening? And you, that's not something that you can just look at somebody and see. Yeah. Or, or look at somebody and, and see that thing, right? So you, you have to take into account that, that it's not just, you know, what is being reflected back to you in the mirror. It's like, what is actually going on in, inside? Um, the other thing that we know about diet soda is that it actually causes an increase in appetite. So while you are convincing yourself emotionally that I'm drinking this thing that has zero calories, what it's actually doing is stimulating your appetite for foods that have greater than zero calories. Wow. So... Like nachos. Like anything that is good and tasty. Okay, so... It, you know, and then there's some other things here too, and I, I know it seems like you kind of brush it aside, but this is super important. So, um, so it stimulates those hunger uh, hormones, alters your taste receptors, um, and triggers dopamine responses in the brain. So dopamine is the chemical that gets flooded into the system when you get a, a feel good, uh, that, that feel good st stimulation, yeah. right? So I have my Diet Coke, I'm happy, I'm having these snacks, and it makes me happy, so I'm having more of them. Now, the, the clever person listening is like, oh, well, when I have a Diet Coke, I just have a Diet Coke, and I don't have anything to go with it. Maybe not in the moment, but think about all the other, you know, things that are going on without it. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, should, should you give up your Diet Coke, no, because I don't know who you are, and I don't know what all the other habits that you have going on throughout your day, what your priorities are, what, all those types of things play a role into the coaching recommendations that we make to people whenever we have these conversations. So there's been plenty of times when I've worked with people individually on their nutrition and lifestyle, things like that, and they tell me, oh, well, I know I should probably cut out that Diet Coke, or... I know that I should cut out the Dr. Pepper that I'm drinking, and it's, no, I'm, I'm not worried about that, like, that, because that, there's such a visceral, psychological, like, attachment to that, that I know enough to know that taking that away, although potentially a, a, a uh, siloed health benefit you would get, what is the stress response that I'm going to be causing on top of that? Wow. So... But again, if I just give you a generalization and say, well, you know, studies have shown that diet soda is not good and it's actually stimulating more hunger, it, that's, that's not enough. That's why we have to spend time individualizing things even, even further. So would you say because, and this question just occurs to me because of the dopamine comment and facts about it, is there an addiction component associated with it? Oh, absolutely. And and I don't I don't mean addiction in the typical uh, negative connotation that it usually has with it. Like you're an addict. Sort yeah, of. I don't I don't mean it so much in that. Although that is certainly possible and probably very likely. Um, 
I, I mean that it, you, you've picked up this habit that was, I'm making a big assumption here, but it's based upon a lot of, you know, observation through a lot of conversations and um, relationships over the years with people, but you probably started drinking Diet Coke because of the zero, the zero on the calorie count. And so you've told yourself the story for however long that it's, it's a, not only a zero calorie, but a zero consequence choice. And th this idea has been embedded deep in you, and now it has just become habit. So that's, the, habit is another word for addiction. So, with that being said, food would probably follow under the same umbrella. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think food addiction is real? Oh, absolutely. I think that um, it's real and it's, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. So, it can be made to be very, very complex when you work with people through those types of things. But there is a tremendous amount of awareness that people need to have if they're serious about making changes. And I know that was kind of one of the questions that we had next with re relation to workouts and such. But um, just things like environmental triggers. Um, it's like when, when you're somebody who's trying to quit smoking, the worst thing that you can do is be around people that are smoking. Right. That's an, that's an, that's the definition of an environmental trigger, right? If you're an alcoholic that's trying to stop drinking, don't go to the bar or be around people that are drinking. So, but it's, it's, it's much less obvious, I think, with the food addiction piece because it's, it, it's just so commonplace. You know, it, it is out there and it's everywhere. You know, these environmental triggers. So, uh, I know that I should be eating breakfast. I get up in the morning. I, I'm rushed to get out the door. So I'm going to either grab something quick that's got a ton of added sugar or I'm going to stop by the fast food joint and eat while I'm in my car. Those are all environmental. Getting into your car has now become the environmental trigger. Wow. Power of habit. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why, that, and yeah, and that's also why that book by um, James Clear that was on my top three reads of, of 2020 was so powerful to me because you start to just see things just through a different lens and how you can, how we can help people more effectively. In the past, you know, if you see somebody that's struggling with, yeah, man, I can't, I can't help it, but have an entire pack of Oreos a night or something like that, you know, I can't help it. In the past, before I became aware, and I guess the word is empathetic, I would just be like, well, just stop eating it, dude. Yeah. Just stop. And it's it's not that easy. It is Again, an example would be somebody that goes to the vending machine at their high school or their job or somewhere where they're at the hospital, you know, wherever they're at every day and they're always getting a Diet Coke or a Dr. Pepper, as you mentioned, like a routine. And in my head, knowing how I am as a person, like having to do the work to one, go to the vending machine, put the money in, get it, you know, like the, that's a step process that would deter me from doing that. And so in my mind, I'm like, just don't go buy the thing, right? right. Just don't go buy the bottle. But now, being a little bit more empathetic and aware yeah. of like how people operate and behave, like it's not, it's way deeper than that. Like they don't care about what, like having to go and do the work or pay the money for X, Y, Z. And that's the struggle that I honestly have as a coach because, like I said, I don't know how long, six hours ago in this in this episode. <laughs> that I do lean very left brain um, logical to where when I sometimes get questions, it's, well, just do this thing. And sometimes I leave out that there is tremendous amount of emotional, I don't want to say baggage because that sounds so negative, but tremendous amount of emotion attached to whatever the behavior is that is being performed up to this point. Yeah. So I have to be very cognizant when I work with people and I make suggestions 
that it's it's not enough, you know, to just say do this thing and do it because I'm the expert and I know what I'm talking about. You have to respect where the the person's come from, their situation, and that's that's why it's not enough to just give people blanket programming or training templates or designs or anything. Why we've been going just so hard on this concept of individualizing things for people because that's actually how we're going to get um, sustainable results for a long time, not just for a six week thing or an eight week thing or a two week thing or a 21 day detox or something like that. Yeah. You know? uh, I'll share this quick story before we move on. So we've been open, this will be our uh, 10 years and you know, there's been another 10 years prior to that, that, you know, I've been a coach. So I'm coming up on 20 years of being a fitness coach, health and fitness coach. And let's just say that I've worked with, I don't know, a few thousand people, right? I can, I can still to this day name them and I know who they are. Um, two, there's only been two people who I have had success with that approach where what I call it's like a, a light switch where it's, they say, you know, how should I be eating? And I give them like the, like boom, 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 boom. Like, you know, um, whole foods, no added this, fresh fruits and vegetables, boom, 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 all, like the, the, the pinnacle of, you know, healthy, you know, eating stuff yeah. like that. There's only been two people that have actually had any success with that. Out of thousands. You know, out of thousands. Wow. And it's it's why I will never ever say that to people again. Yeah. Because it's it's not the solution. You know, it was very, very unique circumstances in both cases. Um, and these two couldn't have been more opposite in terms of responsibility, age, history. So it's a it's a miracle that because they were so different that they both were able to do that um, but it also was a huge learning point for me as a coach to realize that you know um, don't make assumptions on you know who could do that and what what conditions would have to exist for that to happen but the biggest lesson was that is a huge mistake to to do the what I call the light switch coaching yeah you know? cool so we only have uh, seven minutes. Yeah. Um, Let, so why don't we why don't we cover? We'll leave them. Well, no. Um, I, I want to go to the movement piece because um, it was something that Tina just asked recently, okay. and I, I think it's important to cover that one. So we'll leave the um, learnings of workouts for next time, um, and I, I want to respect the people who, you know, gave a, or submitted a question very recently versus something that, you know, we kind of created. Yeah, for sure. So this one is, I'll read it and then I'll let you kind of answer it, um, or start answering it. Um, how do good mornings, and this is in regards to like the training block that we're in right now is focused on upper body pulling strength and then getting people to understand and dial in their what we call scapular control but put another way just keeping their shoulders in a good safe strong position so we do that through hollow and arch progressions and so when tina was in on monday i believe you said it was we were doing some good mornings and you reviewed what the block of training was and she asked a really really great question around hey if our focus our priority for this block of training is upper body pulling strength, hollow and arch control. How do good mornings play a role in that? So I know what I kind of want to say to this, but I, I want to hear what your lead in is. Yeah, so I'll make it quick because we only got uh, five or six minutes. I was kind of put on the spot and so I answered, you know, for face value, I guess you could say like, yeah, so the good morning is a hip hinging movement. So we're teaching us how to move and operate solely at our hips and our knees a little bit, but mainly how can we move our hips in space, which is really important to know how to do in life, like functionally, like when you're doing certain things. Um, but also if you care about, you know, 
how you're doing in the gym. And so Tina actually knew this before I said it because she was kind of finishing my sentence for me is, you know, there's basically two points in the hollow and arch where your body's moving. The shoulders, so we're trying to teach scapular control, and then what your lower body is doing, which the, as an axle, or the, the pivot point mm -hmm. is your, at your hips. So you have your shoulders and your hips. Um, and so teaching you how to move properly at your hips um, will benefit you in the hollow arch, which in turn is gonna improve your scapular control and just improve um, your shoulder strength and stability. But also, although the training block is primarily focusing on upper body pulling strength, getting better at that and scapular control, that doesn't mean we can neglect the other things. Right. So that's where the goblet squats we've been doing, the good mornings we've been doing, um, the long aerobic days where we might not even see any rig work, like falls into the same focus is if we only did pull-ups and hollow and arches for five weeks that, you know, that's how long this training block's gonna be, our shoulders would be hurting, right? And, yeah, that should be counterproductive. Yeah, it'd be completely counterproductive. So not only are we trying to put a lot of focus in something that a lot of people care about with upper body pulling and hollow and arch progressions, but we also have to make sure people are in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was my shorthand answer. Yeah, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head. I think there's a couple things to, to just to remember is I love, just because I'm, I'm a big nerd when it comes to movement and biomechanics, I love seeing movements that are seemingly very unrelated and then taking the time to notice how interconnected pretty much all movement really is. So in a, in a good morning, in this instance, the, the connection that I would make is, you know, uh, it, it is a hinging movement. So when we think about patterns, you know, your the hinge is where you generate power from your hip, and in a really well done, you know, as you you know uh, get more control and more strength in the hollow and arch, you start to generate more power from the hip and the shoulder too. But a lot of it, the bulk of it, is is certainly going to come from your hips, um, and and that hinging movement. So. The good morning, while it doesn't look like a hollow and arch up on the bar, we are teaching the technical term is proprioception, but understanding and becoming aware and able to control your body's position in space. So when I'm hinging forward, you know, it can look like if you take that bar and, and imagine somebody's up on the rig, it can look a lot like an aggressive hollow and arch. It's also teaching you how to maintain rigidity in your trunk, in your midline, um, in your lower body, things that are, when we see somebody that starts to swing and not actually hollow and arch with control, the reason for that is lack of proprioception and lack of stability in the lower body and the midline. So we call it like squishy in the middle and the knees bend a lot. Whenever we say, hey, soften the knees but lock that position in in a good morning, if you think about you know the control that it takes to have a really good hollow and arch, those are things that transfer over. So I think it's a really good question, number one, because for me what that tells me is uh, that you know she embodies that piece about being curious, which I love, and it's a really good question for us as coaches too because we can sit back and it's not a bad thing to say like, hmm, I never thought about that. Like, let me, let me think about why and I'll have an answer for you. Yeah. You know, there's nothing, there's certainly nothing wrong with saying saying that um but yeah and then the other part that you covered i think well is when when we say that and maybe maybe we can you know change this up a little bit or add some more context for people when we say that the priority is upper body pulling and hollow and arch that's priority one it doesn't mean so that's what we call primary it doesn't mean that there's not a secondary and a tertiary yeah right priority and this is um this is the way the good progressive programming works is, you know, you can do things concurrently, but still the majority of the emphasis is on this thing, but we're still going to adapt and improve in other areas. Now, it's not going to be as much as, but it's still important that we're not just doing upper body pulling because like you highlighted, it's, it would probably end up being counterproductive in the long run. Right. 
that might have been the shortest answer we've ever had for a listener question just because of the condensed time. Yeah, I, you got your heart out in uh, zero seconds. That's right now. So, Josh, thank you, man. This is a good episode. We spent a lot of time on sugar. I really hope people list, can take some time and listen to all of it if you can, or at least part of it, and learn you something. I sure did um, yesterday and today. Well, I'll share this real quick because Melissa Zabel popped on and said uh, yeah, diet soda um, makes her crave sweets, but she still loves it. Um, one of my favorites, I don't, I, I haven't had one in a long time, but it was Diet Dr. Pepper. I used to slam those. Diet Dr. Pepper is way better than the Miss Dr. Pepper. No. Nice. Yes. That's it. That's way. the end. Mark won't. This is Mark's first. last episode, folks. No, uh, I, I'm a, uh, I don't think they are the same at all. I think... Uh, but I, if I had a choice, I would always pick regular. But there was a long period of time where I was slamming, slamming Diet Dr. Peppers up and right. Oh, man. Yeah. And their colors are way better. The red on white versus the white on red. You better be careful, man. You'll cut you. Uh-oh. You know, with the Dr. Pepper comment. But yeah, that's it for me. Episode number 61. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Live watchers, live listeners, uh, late listeners, whatever.